panel, very excellent panel. Um, two quick questions. Uh, I want to hear more about Lyme disease. Uh, I'm a climate change, uh, climate justice activist in Montreal, and we're beginning a campaign on Lyme disease. If you could just fill in, Curtis, a little bit about maybe people are, I hope people are aware of Lyme disease as a, as a horror and uh, as a consequence of climate change. I'd like to hear more. And then Martin about uh, soil, uh, the soil depletion. I'd like for you to convey to people how serious the situation is. Thank you. Quick question for Martin. Can we feed the world with your solution? Seven billion going to nine billion? Thank you very much. Um, so thank you to the panel. My question is also for Martin. And Martin, I want to know if the work you're doing is replicable uh, for small stakeholder farmers, if there's some kind of a toolkit or some kind of uh, information that can be replicated in the countries at least neighboring Ethiopia. Thank you. Martin, I guess you're a popular guy. Um, <laughs> I got a question relating to biofuels. So I was wondering if you're finding certain crops are better uh, we're getting better energy return on investments out of them and where those are being grown. Yeah, in the, in the Middle East, Donald Trump is proposing a two-state solution that will make all the people happy. I'm wondering if you could propose or think of one or two or even three elements in climate change that would cover the energy aspects, the economic aspects, and the environmental aspects that would be feasible and make all the people happy? Oh, just a simple question on that one, folks. So you have fun with that. We got one more over here, and then we're going to go to the panelists. I'm just changing it because I'm feeling the room, and we seem to have time and space for it. So, Hi. Thanks very much for your comments already. Very interesting. My name is Dinah Robinson, and I used to work with Ottawa Public Health. And I'm now working with an organization called Bee City Canada. And we're focused on getting country, uh, cities across the country to uh, really formally support uh, pollinator initiatives and increase green space. So I'm looking for your comments on the public health aspects of that, food security, mental health, and uh, agri-food aspects. Um, I'll talk about Lyme disease first. Um, so basically, when you're out in the woods today, <laughs> uh, make sure you s strip down and have a look and make sure there's no ticks on you at the end of your walks. I, I think that's the main message. It is possible. I'm not sure why Lyme disease is now uh, so prevalent in, in Ontario and Quebec, but um, I don't know if it's actually the tick or the, the, uh, the bacteria that's sort of uh, spread north, but um, it, it does seem that you can get Lyme disease without getting a tick bite, although you, you wonder how that happens. Um, most of the time, uh, you need to have had a tick on you for at least 24 hours. And uh, the key is to get the tick removed. Uh, it doesn't matter too much how you do it, although people uh, sort of focus on getting the, ho the, the, the claws out of your skin. But uh, basically, get it out as best you can with a credit card or something to scrape it off. Um, the, th the thing is, if you do leave the head in there, it just uh, it can kind of scar in there and take a few uh, months to years to come out of there. But it's not a, it's not a, it's not, besides being cosmetic, it doesn't cause the infection. So the, the big thing about the bacteria is that it's, yeah, it's in the saliva glands, I think, I believe, of the, of the tick. And this bacteria has a, uh, a terrible propensity to cause very sort of complex symptoms and diseases. It always starts with a rash. Um, so after and in the spot of the tick bite, you get this uh, this sort of slowly developing red patch that spreads out over days to weeks, um, and then disappears. Um, and that's that's the time either either when you notice the tick, or you see the red patch, then you should go get it treated. In terms of uh, causing epidemics or 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 you know, I, I, it's not the big my big concern with climate change. I think. Uh, it's, it's maybe a, a harbinger of other diseases to come. Um, you know, it's endemic in the United States and has been for many years, and uh, there is a good treatment for it if you get even just a simple antibiotic for, for 10 days. I think you can even use uh, two or three days of antibiotics. It's actually very effective. So um, I'm not so much worried about that, uh, I, but uh, other, other vector diseases are, are coming, I think. Uh, you know, at one time, uh, I think it was... Uh, 
at least tens of thousands of years ago, there was malaria in the Ottawa Valley. So, you know, it, certainly that's a much more devastating disease and, and requires significant treatment and um, uh, is very deadly uh, for certain populations or for in some cases. Um, you know, without treatment in a, in, a, in a system that doesn't have access, maybe doesn't have all, we, all the medications we need, that's certainly something that could be very deadly going forward. Um, and I was just going to, I'll answer the public health question, sorry, uh, was about uh, the, oh yeah, pollinators in, in the cities and public health concerns. You know, I, I'm, I'm kind of, I'm interested in uh, the, having green spaces in the city. I certainly think uh, having uh, uh, wildlife trees, especially, uh, is very important. You know, people have done good studies looking at exposure to trees and that if your hospital window faces a, a treed park, you're, you have a much better uh, outcome than if you don't face a treed park. And it's, it's quite impressive. I don't remember the statistics, but um, uh, children that live near parks have less asthma. You know, there's, there's a lot of uh, little studies like that on, on green spaces. In terms of public health, I think that's, that's my main ex exposure to that. I, you know, I, I'm very thankful for pollinators, and I really love... Uh, apple trees and they're growing wild in the city you know I think it's a it's an amazing uh, thing to have that you know having grown up in the country mostly in Alberta I think the city is quite deprived although Ottawa is amazing I, I most recently lived in Montreal and I was very happy to move to Ottawa and find uh, the green space amazing here <laughs> <laughs> it's better now that was 20 years ago Sure, yeah, I'll try to be quick on some of these. Um, I think uh, the soil question is a, is a really critical one. Um, uh, soil is alive. Um, so in, a, in a cubic inch of healthy soil, there can be millions of microorganisms. Um, just like in your gut, uh, most of those microorganisms are beneficial. Um, they help the plants grow they, in ways that we don't even understand. Um, our pesticide use, our fertilizer use, uh, is killing those microorganisms. Uh, we end up with dead soil, meaning that it takes even more fertilizer and more pesticides to get those same plants to grow to the same uh, extent. Um, between that, between the, the uh, thankfully the full plowing is, is becoming less. People are doing a lot more no-till farming, so we're losing a lot less topsoil due to runoff, at least in North America. Um, but, but runoff, the uh, overuse of chemicals and fertilizers, uh, is a, a serious issue around the world. Um, we find uh, the farmers that we work with uh, primarily are very, very marginalized farmers. Um, we, you know, when I talked about 3,600 meters, uh, you know, that's nearly the height of the highest el mountain in Alberta. Uh, that's where people are farming, uh, in part because uh, a lot of people have been pushed out of the valleys because the valleys have been taken over by corporate farms. Uh, and so small-scale farmers have moved up the mountainsides. Um, it's fragile existence. We're in Honduras because Hurricane Mitch washed out those hillsides. Um, and so, uh, so wherever we're at, soil is a big concern. Um, and um, soil is, is most healthy uh, when your agriculture that you're doing on it is biodiverse. Uh, where you're not doing monocropping, where you are uh, using uh, a variety of, of plants that, uh, that take from and feed the soil in different ways. Uh, and so, you know, agroecology is, is uh, a primary way to help restore uh, our soils, but also to protect our soils. Um, with respect to feeding the world, um, yes. Uh, there's currently enough food in the world, uh, you know, uh, look around a shopping mall in North America, and uh, we're not doing a very good job of feeding ourselves right now. Um, it has much more to do with distribution and the types of food that we're eating than it does uh, the calories and the nutrients that we're producing. Um, the International, Pol International Panel of Experts on Sustainable Food Systems uh, recently put out a report um, calling on the need for the world to transition to agroecology uh, and in that report firmly firmly confirmed that the the potential for production within those systems uh, would easily feed nine billion people the challenge that we have is uh, we are locked into particular systems right now uh, and we do need to address questions of, of uh, distribution and equity within our food systems um, on a toolkit we're working on it 
Um, we, one of the things we've realized over the course of these, this, our last five years of programming is that uh, our ability to scale out uh, and spread uh, is very limited because of our size. So we're now what we're really focusing on doing is, is knowledge sharing, um, developing systems for people to be able to use. So check out our website. Um, but, uh, you know, a lot of what we do, it's, it's not rocket science. You know, it's, uh, it's good agriculture. There are lots of people around the world doing it. Uh, and so the resources are out there. Uh, it is a matter of, of uh, finding it and putting it together. Um, we don't actually, I don't actually know a lot about biofuels. Um, biofuels has been a problem in, in North America in terms of, uh, of crop replacement. Um, people uh, shifting to highly subsidized biofuel production uh, and away from food production. Um, we see that as well with palm oil plantations, peanut oil plantations. Um, and, and again, it's not necessarily so much that those are good fuels or bad fuels, but we are developing systems of subsidization um, that make those more economically viable than f producing food. Uh, and, and that's a problem. Um, and uh, I think I'll leave it there. Um, I mean, the pollinators are, uh, you know, they're critical for agriculture. Um, our agriculture is killing <laughs> pollinators, uh, and so, so it, it's kind of a two-sided coin. We need the pollinators, but we also need to change the way we're doing agriculture to help protect them. Um, I'm definitely not going to take on the agriculture and health questions. Um, but the, the difficult one about what could be feasible, make everyone happy and address everything. Um, <laughs> 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 I'll, I'll give a, a, an unsatisfactory answer, but at least take a stab. Um, I think my favorite one is, you know, and Joanna touched on this yesterday, we have an epidemic of loneliness and depression in the developed world. Uh, we overconsume, thinking that momentarily that's going to make us happy. It doesn't. Um, and so I think if we can move more to a service-based economy, uh, you know, when you go on a meditation retreat, it makes you feel good. You're connected to people. You're not consuming anything. Same with massage, same with yoga. So if you can start thinking about buying services that make us happy rather than buy things that don't make us happy, I think that will go maybe some way. Another thing that really pisses me off in this country because I tried to do... Um, to go from Montreal to, to Ottawa a lot is trains. Trains in this country give priority to commodities over people. They have appointments they can't miss. Our schedule doesn't seem to matter. Um, I think trains are a very pleasant way of, of you know, traveling. You can read, you can do something else, you can watch out the deers and all the beautiful scenery outside. It's much better than the car. Um, but commodities have priority and that really reduces the, the, the quantity of transport that you, us humans can have. Well, <laughs> okay, but well, not the perfect solution. I said it, it was unsatisfactory. <laughs> um, and one thing that bugs me as a lawyer is the, the, you know, the train companies were privatized, but they kept the powers of a public institution, and that's why they, they, they make the law on the tra train tracks, and that's not okay. Um, just to say a quick word about um, the, the, the health impacts that climate change will have, um, I'm, at least I wrote some articles on it, and I think some lawyers are actually thinking about bringing cases about this in Canada, but our charter protects our right to, to life and security, and climate change is threatening our life and security, and theoretically, <laughs> you could bring a case against the Canadian government for its inaction. Would it win? Not sure, but maybe it would motivate action. Um, and on biofuels, just going back to my university days from uh, way, way back, I think the only form of biofuels that's acceptable is the one that's done from waste, agricultural waste, otherwise it competes with crops and it's bad. That was a good list of initial questions, and uh, I see a couple of hands popping up, so I'm just going to do a quick time check here. We have 20 minutes. We're doing good. So I do want to invite people in this round. Again, welcome your questions for the panelists. Also, if you have an inspiring example of mo mobilizing people, do share it. I am going to hold you to around one minute so we can have another round. Okay. Do you want to start over there? Okay. Lynn Adamson, I just wanted to... Um, come back to this question of agriculture because it's so important. Uh, I wanted to, to get comments on a whole food plant-based diet. Still hearing me. Okay. Uh, versus um, kind of more integrated farming versus, of course, industrial agriculture. And a lot of our food is industrial agriculture. So I myself am doing a whole food plant-based diet. 
which has brought my blood pressure down 40 points, just so everybody gets inspired. And um, no oil. The key thing was no oil cheese. That's it. But the, but I was coming back to you, what your comment this morning, Tracy, about getting the uh, plow rather than digging. I don't know what that effect is, but the whole thing around the carbon you know, sequestration in through agriculture. Mm -hmm. So if, if we could address that a little bit, I appreciate sure. that. Thank you. Excellent. Thanks, Lynn. Maybe over to Angela in the back. Yeah, my, my question is for Karin. Um, I'm very interested in climate tests. Um, you made a passing reference to the infrastructure bank, um, and I've, I've seen a quick blip that they are or have developed some kind of a climate test um, for things that they're funding. I'm wondering if um, you know more about that and if there's any legal sticks that we can use to make them do that. Um, I, I think it's very easy to understand that we need a climate test for like a big pipeline. Um, however, I think that we should also generalize that. So I think that here at the municipal level, for example, when the city of Ottawa decides to buy a new paratransport um, vehicle, I think there should be a climate test and we should think about can, they be be can we be buying an electric vehicle or mm -hmm. a fossil fuel burning one. So I think we need to mainstream this to all of our public asset acquisitions and have climate tests on all of them. So in the upcoming municipal election, Ecology Ottawa, who many of you may have passing acquaintance with, um, have asked in a survey to candidates whether they're in favor of a climate test. Now, I suspect many of those candidates have really no clue what that question meant. Um, I think that in this seminar today, we've, we've learned a little bit of and giving us more context. Um, but I think that's one way forward in terms of local action. Um, and just because there was an invitation for actions, um, we have organized uh, three candidate debate events around environmental issues. So there's little flyers here for those of you living in Rideau Vanier or Rideau Rockcliffe or Capital Ward. Thanks so much, Angela. Can I see the hands again for people who had? Okay, so we've got quite a few here. Okay, is there any more over there? Did you? Well, thank you. I, I would be sharing um, an experience. I want to congratulate uh, Martin for what uh, he is heading in terms of uh, community-based uh, development um, efforts in, in agriculture. Uh, in way back in the 80s, um, there was a big famine in Ethiopia. About a million died. Uh, the greatest shock in my life um, I joined the Red Cross and I went to uh, an area where people were dislocated and living in a camp. Uh, in that camp, there were about, about 30,000 people and a minimum of 130 people were dying a day. Mm. It, was, it was a terrible time. So we, we did uh, everything possible to save lives and then I was uh, sort of um, catapulted to lead the, the Ethiopian Red Cross, and I, I started asking myself, what then? Life saved, yes. What, what then? In resettling, when we re resettled the community we were supporting, uh, we used uh, the Ministry of Agriculture Extension agents uh, and um, mobilize the people. I call it need aware communities. They can accept, receive any advice, any support to reestablish their lives. And that's what happened. For example, in just one weekend, Friday, Saturday, Sunday, the Ministry of Agriculture multiplied seeds. One million tree seedlings were planted on hills around there. 90% was the survival rate. The community was willing to work 24 hours. And uh, the resilience transformation from that kind of support was fantastic. Yeah. Uh, from there, we concluded that um, the best way to support is not to import food yes. stuff. Yes. It's to make it themselves. Thank you. Absolutely. 
and such a I love how that's coming full circle, linking how uh, you know agriculture and local agriculture is also a healthcare issue, and it's about lives, right? Um, um, my uh, question is also to Martin and follows on what the gentleman to my left has uh, has just said, and the reference earlier on in the uh, here about uh, the need for uh, uh, toilets in downtown Ottawa. Since about the 1840s to 1860s, uh, London has been trying to treat its sewage. And uh, apparently at some point up to that time, uh, the sewage had been sold, the night soil. And it was uh, put out to the farms in the surrounding area, and there was a thriving business around that. With the advent of the uh, water closet, uh, so such an, a mixture was added that it was impossible to uh, make anything out of it. It was no longer advisable to do that, and it was commercially unviable. Berlin had a system of recycling uh, into nature till about the Second World War. What, uh, what uh, initiatives are currently being made, if any, to, uh, again, uh, bring town and country together so that the night soil uh, that, that results from our consumption of food is recycled and reused by people? Thank you. Thanks very much. So can I just get a show of hands again? I'm, I'm just looking at the time. I've got 10 minutes left. So I've got a tricky thing here and then I've got three speakers. I've got 10 minutes left. I do want to I do want to give the opportunity for these folks to hear. So you haven't spoke yet and you haven't spoken yet. So I'm going to ask if you don't mind to save it for afterwards. So and if we can keep it quick, that would be great. Thank you very much. My question is mainly for Curtis. I've been puzzled for quite a bit of time with the statistical relationship between heat waves and mortality. In 2003, there was an enormous heat wave in Europe. The first estimates were that somewhere in the order of 14,000 people died prematurely. Literature recently has bumped that number up to about 40,000. In 2010, there was a heat wave in Russia over a much larger area with about 10,000 people perishing. And there we have this heat wave that we've had it, um, recently this year. And the numbers are really quite small compared to that. And I don't understand why. I don't understand, I mean, understand how the statistics are collected and what actually defines a premature mortality or whatever. But it's confusing to me, but it's something that clearly is an issue for, for tackling climate change. Thank you. Uh, Anthony, uh, so it's kind of for all three panelists and it kind of merges a bit all of the topics that you're talking about. But I was wondering if the panelists were uh, familiar with an initiative that tried to link doing a climate test in the allocation of kind of the fair share of what Canada has to do to institutions and their procurement policy. Uh, and I'm particularly thinking about food, uh, but to encourage the purchasing of sustainable foods, so plant-based foods, and also agroecology and the community-based agriculture, so that's preferred in the purchasing policy. And I mention this because uh, there is an initiative by the Friends of the Earth, the United States, in the United States, to try to have food procurement policies that are sustainable, mm -hmm. and they talk about the Paris Agreement, and they yeah. kind of say that you know that could be done, and that there are some health. Uh, I think there are some hospitals in the United States that are starting to go in that direction, not mm -hmm. completely, uh, but this is an interesting avenue to push the federal government on, since they do mm -hmm. own a lot of institutions, cafeterias, or there's cafeterias in a lot of their buildings. And then also because there is, and this goes back to mobilization, I was in Montreal recently and there was a group of vegans, a, a vegan group that had a petition that already has 13,000 signatures to call on the federal government to include plant-based options in their cafeterias, which doesn't really go that far. They made a bit of the link to climate, to climate change, but it seems to me like that ask could have been much more ambitious considering the science backs it up. Uh, but that's a way maybe to link these uh, things together and to get that demographic, the vegan, the very organized uh, and motivated group to back all three of the initiatives that are being, uh, or uh, yeah, all three kind of the threads that were just being discussed right now. Thanks so much. 
Okay, so I'm just looking at the time here. I think what we'll do is we'll do a round. Okay, so you have the opportunity. I wanna do wanna close it at ten at ten minutes. I do wanna take the opportunity of being a moderator and just remind ourselves of what Joanna said last night of climate change being a wicked problem. Um, and how it's so complex. I think one of the beautiful things about climate solutions, though, is recognizing that there is no one silver bull bullet solution. I would argue, and challenge me afterwards if you want to, um, there won't be one silver bullet solution, but there are many solutions, and they're beautiful, and that climate jobs can be healthcare jobs. They can be a teacher, going back to what you said here, Karin, that there's many solutions, and it's this this panel and these topics are bringing that up, that it's not just about ramping down fossil fuel production, because it is, um, but it's about so much more about building what we want. So why don't we start on the left, go right. Can you hear me? Hello. Thank you, Dr. Song. Um, uh, in terms of the mortality uh, and heat waves, it, it's... It is hard. I think just like in weather, it's hard to um, know whether any individual storm is due to climate change or, uh, or just uh, w would we have expected it anyway. Um, it, it mortality is a bit like that as well. Uh, I know when I see a patient, when I have a patient die, um, it, 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 it maybe sounds surprising to hear this, but it's, it's sometimes very hard to know exactly what they died from. Um, uh, and, and certainly uh, the mortality that we see in heat waves uh, early on, or like in the, in the heat waves that we experience here in Canada, it's often the vulnerable populations. So um, the, the malnourished, um, the homeless, uh, people on a lot of psychiatric medications, which predisposes to sort of heat over a heat injury. Uh, elderly, um, they and they often get they exacerbates other illnesses. So it's not that uh, they come in to uh, you know to be blunt, the morgue with a label of heat death on them. It's often they died of a heart attack, and <clears throat> it's only when we look at it really retrospectively we notice you know these we see a lot of heart attacks suddenly uh, uh, during the heat wave that we kind of put it all together. Um, the other answer to part of that question is, you know, it, the different populations will have different vulnerabilities. Uh, uh, you know, not only is it more or less hot during a heat wave, uh, but you'll have more of these at-risk populations and more access to uh, health care and even cooling centers and food and nutrition. Uh, so, you know, it's a, it's a complex science. Uh, uh, I, the easiest thing to do is just look back and see a little blip on, a, on, on the mortality statistics and say, well, that looks like that's from the heat wave, you know. Anyways, I don't know if that really answers your question, but suffice to say, it's complex. And just like, just like blaming one storm on, on climate change, I, you know, I want to do it, but, uh, uh, you know, I get my hand slapped by yeah, the statisticians. Yeah. <laughs> um, and I'll just say one thing about uh, local food. We, we have a, an amazing lady in the Children's Hospital a, a cafeteria, running the cafeteria, who's really into local foods and has made kind of re revolutionized our cafeteria. Anyway, we have great food down there and most of it's local and a lot of it's actually grown on site in our healing garden now. So it's a, it's been quite a, an amazing a transformation if you're ever at Chio and you want a bite to eat. <laughs> <laughs> um, on the whole food diets, I think, uh, you know, the, the principles behind diet for a small planet from, you know, 40 years ago uh, still hold true. 60% um, of, the, of the calories produced in uh, our agricultural systems around the world um, feed humans. Uh, the other 40% is lost uh, in production of meat or in biofuels and, and other uses. Uh, so there is a, a huge amount of diversion of our agricultural um, produce. Um, but at the same time, from our perspective, um, Animals are actually a, a, a significant and important part of, of a biodiverse agroecological production. Uh, and so I wouldn't you know, want to, to say no animal meat, but certainly the balance, th especially here in North America, is, is severely off you know, in terms of how we are uh, eating things. With respect to carbon sequestration, 
Um, this is one that there's actually a, an increasing amount of, of work looking at. Um, again, mixed systems that incorporate agroforestry uh, products into them that incorporate perennial plants uh, are far better, have higher rates of carbon sequestration. Uh, Large-scale monoculture uh, has temporary sequestration. <laughs> you put it in for one year and then you plow it out at the end of the year. Uh, and so, so again, uh, mixed farming systems do far better at uh, at sequestration. We can also, in the long run, look to things like uh, perennial wheat, which is being developed um, in a, a couple of places. Uh, perennial wheat can sequester uh, some 10 times the amount of carbon uh, that an annual wheat will do. Um, sorry? In the roots. In the roots, yeah, in the root systems. Um, on composting human waste, uh, we, we promote the use of compost around the world, um, particularly uh, vermicompost, uh, primarily of animal and, and other, uh, wa other waste products. I don't know of a lot of places that are looking at, at human waste. I think there is a lot of health risk uh, related to, to the use of human waste if it's not properly uh, well composted. Uh, it can be safe, but it, you know, at at what ends up being industrial scales when you're talking about cities, uh, anything at an industrial scale brings in its own, um, its own health risks. Um, interestingly, for public procurement questions, um, mentioned in my bio, I helped to develop a, a locally sourced school meal system uh, in England. Uh, we had a, a heck of a time navigating the legal uh, uh, ramifications of trying to specify that we wanted to have local produce uh, because of the EU regulations uh, that permitted, uh, you know, fair competition uh, uh, that prohibited people being able to put a geographic location on it. That's one of the pieces that's being taken up at the World Food Secure the World Food Security uh, Committee, um, and. Uh, uh, countries like Brazil have actually been leading on that, uh, having national policies around local procurement, public procurement, uh, especially into their schools and hospital systems. Um, there's a lot more that can be done. Uh, I think the challenge for Canada is that actually our food, s our, our agricultural system is actually not directed towards feeding Canadians. 90% uh, of the food we grow in is exported, 80% of the food we eat is imported. Uh, and so we need to reorient our, our own food production so that our procurement systems can actually um, make it viable at scale. Um, so I'll start with the, the climate test question. Um, I think I rem vaguely remember seeing a document pass about the infrastructure bank, and I may be wrong, but I would from my memory, it probably had beautiful pictures, nice buzzwords, but no teeth. Um, and that's normally called a guidance document in, in, in uh, the federal system. And, you know, relating back to climate, we've had a guidance document on how to include climate considerations and assessments since 2003. It's just never been applied because no one has to. It's just guidance. It's not mandatory. Um, but one way to fix that, and that's like one of the main issues with the Bill C-69 that's currently being reviewed, is we have no idea to what projects it will apply. Um, I focused on pipeline because this was about mobilizing, and we mobilize on the pipeline. We haven't really mobilized on the rest that much. Um, but we don't know which projects will be subject to it. So something that would be good is to say any project funded by the infrastructure bank needs to have an environmental impact assessment. So far, that's not the approach that the federal government's taking, but maybe a campaign could change their mind. Likewise, forestry and agriculture have never been subjected to environmental assessment. Maybe they should, because they clearly have a role in climate, um, either mitigation or, or uh, emissions. Um, totally agree that we need to generalize the climate test. The, the pipeline one is it's the easiest one to focus on, uh, but it should be mainstream to everything, including what we think are climate solutions. Um, the, the Site C Hydro Dam in, in British Columbia, um, it, it, it was um, approved even if it had uh, the most <coughs> amount of significant adverse effect in the history of environmental assessment in Canada, um, huge violations of indigenous rights, and it was justified as a climate solution on the un untested assertion of the proponent uh, that it was the, the, the least carbon intensive way of producing energy uh, bar nuclear. Now, the way to fix that is to have a robust alternatives uh, assessment within assessments, which here would have been 
oh, do we really need that electricity? Can we achieve it in some other ways? Could we do demand reduction instead? And there have been independent studies on that specific project that showed that it was not the most, uh, <laughs> the best way to, to try to get a climate solution. So also important not to fall for false solutions. Um, I, I want to say some stuff a bit about um, <laughs> night soil, or because um, um, in a, I don't know why, but at some point I wanted to make a movie about poop. Um, <laughs> 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 you know, in Quebec, I was um, there's a big thing. So where in there there are cities that do not have aqueducts, and maybe that's good because now what happens with these superstorms we get is that uh, you, you get they, they overflood our systems, and then you get our our dirty water just sort of flowing into our lakes and rivers and contaminating people. Um, but there are huge regulatory hurdles to developing dry toilet systems because our regulation, at least in Quebec, really promotes uh, aqueducts or uh, septic tanks and whatever. And please don't put that in the video, but apparently it's because the regulation was written by the septic tank mafia. Um, so, you know, if we could maybe overcome those hurdles, we could get dry toilets and minimize the problem. And, and it's an easier resource to use if it's a dry toilet than if it's just been flushed down. Can I just add, uh, there's a great book called uh, Human Manure. Manure? I, anyway, I, I read this book and it's, it's <laughs> for my for a little cabin and there's a, I mean, anyway. <laughs> <laughs> I hate to tell people, my kids were scared to use it at first, but it's actually uh, quite sanitary and you just need a composter, really. Uh, on an individual basis, on a citywide basis, I'm not sure how it would work, but it's very, vi very viable. And um, just... Uh, Trivia, apparently toilets is one of the areas where there's the most patent applications in the world, so there are a lot of people trying to figure out a solution, at least. <laughs> okay, I just want to invite everybody to give a round of applause again for this panel. <laughs>